before you were getting ready to fight Raymond Daniels, you mentioned it's nothing personal. It's just business. business. But were there any fights that really stick out in memory that were a little bit on the personal side for you? What's up, combat sports fan? That's I am being joined by Glory Kickboxing Hall of Famer, the former welterweight champion of the world, and now commentator for Glory Kickboxing. It is Bazooka Joe. Bazooka, you made my life really easy the other day because you posted your my bookie AG post and you introed yourself, you interviewed yourself. So it made it very simple for me to write your uh, intro today. Yeah, people actually like that video. They're like, <laughs> you need to do more of those. It's like showing a little bit more of your personality than always the combat sports, the technique, the fighting, the pad work. So uh, people enjoying those little fun things I'm doing. So happy it went well. I do have to poke a little bit of fun at you, though, for, you know, picking against our boy DP over here. Uh, mm. He's never lost back to back fights and you just had all the faith in St. Denise. I did. I was very upset with that pick, too. I know uh, DP is my guy, too, and I like him. But when I go to my bookie, I really sit things through. I saw the momentum and I, I let my fans down. So sorry. Everybody. Yeah, but you didn't you didn't do too bad, though. You still picked uh, Two out of three. and yeah. Jack De La Maddalena. So now I'm curious on what your pick would have been for the MVP versus Kevin Holland fight. Okay. So this is a little bit of a side story. So I had the pick on that. I would have picked MVP, but the person who gets me the, my bookie work is uh, Kevin Holland's manager. So I couldn't go publicly <laughs> to go against Kevin Holland, but my real pick would have been MVP for sure. Yeah. That's nice. I've uh, talked to his manager as well. Uh, they're a funny group of people over there. And Kevin Holland has always taken on uh, the craziest of fights, a lot like yourself. I was looking through your Instagram, and one of the fights that you took was against a guy who had 70 professional fights. But mm -hmm. when you think about all the great things that happened in your career, do you have a specific moment that stands out as the best of all time? Hmm, that's a tough one. I mean, winning that world title is pr was pretty good. So, um, but other than that, I would say maybe my glory debut. It was, um, I was still new to my career. They sent me to Turkey in glory six, which is crazy how far away that was. But uh, glory six, I've never been to Europe. I've never traveled. I've never fought internationally. And then they sent me to Turkey to fight uh, one of their legends in the sport, uh, Murat Derechi. And I was there. They they told me when I signed the fight, they were like, listen, we're going to sign you for two fights. Don't worry about this first one. Uh, and then we'll get you another fight, which means you're going to lose this one. We're going to get you beat up and then we're going to get you another fight. So I said, OK. So I said yes anyways. And uh, I spoiled the party for him. And just to be in Turkey to beat up. A legend i finished them too so to beat him and then i uh, get that recognition and to know that i was that good on the big stage was my favorite moment for sure so when you were getting that contract initially and you kind of talk, look back at it now and you're like oh they were kind of setting you up to go against this really good guy did you have that mindset or like managerial advice in that moment or is that something you're looking retrospectively and being like oh they were totally like thinking i was going to lose that fight no, I knew, but uh, all I did was I had so much trust in my coach at that point where I just looked at him. I said, can I beat him? And he said, yeah. I said, okay, let's do it. So, I mean, that's all it took for me. I mean, I'm not a film watcher. I uh, I didn't really know who he was. I heard the name. So then I watched his highlight and I was like, after 30 seconds, I'm like, I don't want to watch this anymore. He fought everybody. <laughs> he fought all these big legends of the sport. He's fought crazy names that i only dreamed about uh fighting and competing against and he was beating them so i was like you know what maybe i won't watch and i'll just keep confident and i'll i'll deal with him when i get there but uh yeah it was more of just trusting my coach to be honest with you looking back i wish i took easier fights i think i would have maybe had a little longer of a career but uh definitely the career wouldn't have been as impactful so Good and well, bad career, at both sides. Your career is still pretty long considering you started so young. You started Taekwondo at seven years old, got your black mm -hmm. belt by 10. And I think that's crazy that you were able to start at such a young age. Was it something that your parents were interested in or was it just something that was like a local Taekwondo studio is nearby? We need to keep our kid busy. Yeah, no, it was more me being obsessed with martial arts movies. It was Jean-Claude Van Damme, Sylvester Stallone um those types of guys on the movies it was like i want to be like them van damme obsessed with um it was blood sport and kickboxer have you seen those 
<laughs> okay, I was gonna pick your brain about the kickboxer one because today's my rest day, and I'm like, do I have to sit back and relax and watch kickboxer tonight? I think so. Is it yes. like the rest of it? <laughs> okay. if, it, if it wasn't for that movie, I don't think I would be in the situation I am today. It was literally oh that God. one movie by him that inspired me that much. And my father was, uh, they grew up, my parents are from Sicily, they uh, came to Canada younger. So they, they didn't have money. They didn't have finances. But my dad always liked martial arts, but he wasn't a martial artist by any means. They didn't have money. There was no kickboxing in Sicily at that, uh, at that point. So um, my dad just wanted to be involved with whatever I did. So at four years old, my dad was training me, practicing what he could. We were watching things in movies, practicing it at home. We turned my basement into like a little training ground with whatever we could. <laughs> and then by seven um because we wanted to start taekwondo at four because my parents were like we don't know what we're doing but we're helping them and then my uh taekwondo instructor said come back at seven so i waited three years my dad couldn't not do anything with me so he kind of taught me what he could and then by uh by seven it was all taekwondo that's adorable and i think that's awesome that your parents kind of have that american dream story of coming uh, to the states and wanting to provide uh, their children with all of the activities and anything that they need because I know you have uh, a few older sisters as well. Does that make yeah, you the baby well of the family? Yes, three older sisters with the baby. So that's probably where my toughness comes from. I had a, a sister who's two years older and we just fought all the time. So uh, oh between God. me and her fighting all the time, it probably gave me a lot of confidence. And you got to think when you're young and your sister's two years older, they hit puberty faster. She was bigger than me. We used to always get in trouble at Taekwondo because she would do Taekwondo as well. And we would just go way too hard and get trouble during sparring class. And But uh, she's definitely one of the influences that made me really tough. She was crazy. Still, yeah, crazy. that was my other question. I was like, do you think being a bit the baby of the family shaped your personality in some way? And I guess that kind of answers the older sister, uh, not older, but the two year older sister bullying you a little bit. But what about the relationship with the two older ones? Were they always like super supportive of your combat sports career? I just think they were a little older at that time. They were like in their 20s. They weren't much around they oh, were wow. starting their lives uh because i think there's a, a 11 year gap between my sisters and i so they were probably too into their teenage lives when i was really young but uh yeah. they were all very supportive they're all amazing with it i have memories of being like five six years old we have it on tape i'm sure it's somewhere but um I would put on like my bathrobe and my family would start cheering and we would reenact the scenes of Rocky where my dad would be like Apollo Creed or Drago. And I would come down and my, my family would cheer me on and then I would knock out my dad and I'd start cheering and my family would celebrate for <laughs> me. So they were practicing that moment for like 25 years later. But uh, it was definitely one where those little things are important. And I think it's uh, amazing to have those little memories. That's adorable. I think it's very precious that you're so close with your family. And that kind of made me curious. Is that why you have chosen to stay in Canada basically your entire life? Because I see that you like to travel a lot for work and stuff. Mm -hmm. But is it being, you know, close to the family that keeps you in that? Or do you just like, you know, enjoy walking around in the snow and shoveling? No, I definitely do not. I definitely would have left uh, a long time ago. I'm so close with my, I never want to leave my nieces, my nephew or my parents. So staying here is, uh, I'd make it work anywhere. Like even now, like when I go uh, recently, I just came back from Holland last week and just going to uh, the famous kickboxing gyms there is Mike's gym. And just being in that gym and seeing the fighters, I was like, in Canada, we might have one other pro fighter too. You're in a room with top 10 of the world in every weight division. And it's like the quality you get in your sparring and your training is crazy. I mean, is it for everybody? Like, I don't know. It's hard sparring. It's aggressive. It's very tough. But uh, you definitely should travel more. And I think that was one thing I look back on and I wish I did a little more. But also, I also had a coach who was different. My coach was old school where he was like, you only stay here. So I never cross trained. I never went to other gyms to spar. He didn't want me going elsewhere. So my whole career was done in the same gym I'm in now, which is a big story. I came here when I was 19. At 30, my coach at that point stopped the gym. Then I took over Bazooka Kickboxing in the same oh. location. So that's how like rooted I am in my one place that I started. I've been here my entire year. It's been almost 20 years training in the same location. Yeah, I was gonna, I want some of my YouTube audience to get an understanding of what it's like to be a business owner as well. And kind of that shift 
and you know going from a high highly competitive fighter to now coaching fighters who want to get to that level so what do you have uh as a piece of advice for someone looking to get into the business ownership aspect of a gym hmm, that's a good one i think it's about uh one i learned it's about passion so when i started so before i actually was a business owner i was actually a high school teacher here in toronto so like my passion for teaching was always there when i was young even in taekwondo when i used to when i became that black belt at 10 my instructor made us teach so i, I learned to be confident teaching adults kids all ages then I, once i was a uh, in high school and elementary school i was a uh, gym was my favorite subject obviously and then i loved being the gym teacher around there and seeing the gym teacher so then i actually became the gym teacher so that passion for learning i think is one of the most important things about being a business owner so being passionate about it like my students can tell like no matter what day you come in i'm either yelling screaming i'm upset they're like why are you upset it's like even though they're paying their membership, like I want them to be here. I want them to get better. I, I get so excited when I see somebody get better still and they've learned something. And some of my favorite student members at my gym are in their 50s, in their 60s, and they found this new passion for martial arts. And I was like, that is amazing for me. So I think just being passionate about the teaching part of it, because if you hate teaching, people are going to realize that in your business. So um, if it's a passion and you like to teach and then people will feed and they'll just keep going. Cause I know some business owners, it's all about the money and not about the passion. Mm -hmm. And you can sense that. Yeah. And you brought up that you were a high school teacher during your fight career as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious because Canada gets like the rap of having a really good education system coming from a stupid old American over yeah. here. So I'm curious, there's like a lot of people nowadays that don't have faith in the school systems. So they're like turning to more to homeschooling. I know you're someone that in the future wants kids or you might already have kids. Um, do you have faith in the school system or are you the type of person who thinks you're going to want to homeschool your children? I think a little bit of both. I think it's important that they get that information from the public system and learning. But I think it's your job as a parent to educate them yourselves too, like what your beliefs are compared to what they're teaching. And I think you have to do both. I think to neglect your child from learning stuff from the public system I mean, it's crazy, but if they come home, then have these conversations with them, I think is the most important part. Um, you can't just trust an adult you don't really know to raise your kids, which is kind of weird for me. But uh, in an ideal world, they'll come home, tell me what they learned. We would talk about it. And then right after talking about it, we go right to learn martial arts. So there you go. School after school. Martial yeah. arts right after. But no, no I do not have children, but... I, they're, they would, in my perfect world, my whole family would have to do martial arts. So that's what my fingers are crossed for. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a, a very interesting, you know, back to back, keeping them busy. I think that's really good. But it brings me to some of the other uh, Canadian fighters that I think of that are also very cerebral, that also mm -hmm. have um, kind of, you know, a similar layout on your YouTube channel, Gabriel Varga, which mm -hmm. brought me to... Um, your bazooka kickboxing training regimen that you have online, which is such a great baby step for me because I'm still like an all jujitsu girl and I want to take baby steps back into getting into striking again. Um, so tell me, when did that idea to build that website happen? And you know, what are you doing with it? What do people need to know about it? Well, it started during COVID when uh, Canada was one of the worst uh, dealt with countries, let's be honest. We were closed basically. Okay, so when we're talking about your uh, website that you got done, uh, it's only $10 a month. What yep. do you think is the best system uh, if you're just getting into it, if you're a beginner? Uh, is it a place for beginners to go? Like, what? How would you approach using your website and getting the most out of it? So I think what I kind of went with is any level could approach it. So if you're very new, I always recommend going to the tutorial section because within the tutorials, you can learn how to throw a jab, how to throw a cross, how to throw a hook. So I individually break down every strike and then I break down every single type of combination, the simple combinations you should know, and then all the main basics. So once you get the main basics out of the tutorial section, you can kind of go to the other sections. Now, there's also... Let's be real. A lot of people at home don't have a bag. They don't have anything. So I have a home section, which requires no equipment. So footwork drills, different types of shadow boxing. And I 
the hundreds of them, just different ways that you can do things without any equipment at home. And then I have a bag work section where if you have a bag, because let's be honest, a lot of people don't know how to use the bag. They come and they just hit it, then they're tired, then they stop. But I want it as a tool because it's a very important one. In my career, I didn't believe in running. My running was bag work. So I've really expanded my whole curriculum on the bag. So you can practice on the bag. And then I have a section for sparring drills. So if you have a partner or you're a coach and you want to practice, so you can go with a partner. So I have kind of different sections. A lot of times they cross, but it depends on which you know type of equipment you have. If you have a partner, don't have a partner. Then from there, each of them is separated into different sections. So if you have a, you're just starting and you're like, oh, well, I don't really know the jab. Then you can go to the boxing section, look at the instructionals on jabs and then learn. Or you can go the other way. You can want to do something within kicking and you say man my round kick really sucks go back to the tutorial section learn that kick then go back to the video and do the video with the higher level concepts with the right technique if that makes sense try to blast that all out in one minute sentence i like it no that's it's a good format to have and i think there's so much access that you're given and the way you break things down is so nice whoever's in the background that's like doing the uh, tutorials or doing the examples in the background. I think that's really helpful too. So it's my last month here in LA with this space. I'm going to have to, you know, make this my little like home gym. Um, the home workout <laughs> section. There you go. Yes, Zero exactly. Okay. So I want to talk about your commentary career now because you've switched paths a little bit, but it's still in the same, you know, area. You're still in combat sports and now you're getting to do it for the promotion that pays you so much respect, made you uh, a hall of famer and really values you. Um, so first of all, how special is it that, you know, you have this promotion value you in that way. And now they're showing that in the ultimate form because they want you talking during the entire broadcast. So what is it like getting a gig like that? And how much do you enjoy it? Well, I think it's something where we both do now, so we can kind of both uh, feel how much we enjoy it. But uh, for me, it was uh, came unexpected, to be honest. It was always the plan. I've always had a plan to do it when I was done my career. But uh, what happened was my career ended quicker than I expected. So uh, the big story with me is on my world title fight, I did suffer a pretty bad concussion. And with that concussion, I ended up having lingering like effects where headaches and couldn't look at light. So um, they lasted a little long with post-concussion syndrome. So while I was recovering from that post-concussion, I decided, I was like, you know what, let me reach out to them and see if I can try commentating. I could speak well. I have an education. It's trying to grow the sport in North America. So I was like, it'd be a perfect opportunity. So they sent me out to Vegas to try it out. And I thought I did terrible, which it's tough. And uh, again, I'm more of, uh, you would know the language, but I'm more of a color commentator than I am. Or I'm more like, you are a great interviewer. I'm not as good as an interviewer as I am talking about the sport. So um, they put me in like a backstage interviewer role for that. And I was mm. like, eh. and it was weird. <laughs> I was interviewing someone, you know, like, so you got to think I, I fought Raymond Daniels in Japan. And then all of a sudden they're like glory 23 Raymond Daniels is fighting Nikki Holtzkin. So both of my opponents are fighting each other. And I had to go backstage and interview them, which was the most awkward thing in the world. Raymond Daniels is such a, an amazing person and kind soul. So it's like, he made yeah. it easy, but the Holtzkin interview, Interview was terrible because we both didn't like each other still at that point so it was terrible uh, but it was really weird and awkward so I thought I did terrible and then uh, next thing you know they asked me to do it full-time for two shows which at this point was glory 26 and 27 and then at that point uh, they said if I want to do it full-time and then I said for sure and then the contract for commentary was to be honest better than my fighting contract uh, better financially it got me on tv more and, and at that point i was like do i want to risk more concussions and brain damage or do i want to continue to do this way and i just decided to continue with the commentary back to me being close to my family which was my decision because if it wasn't for my family my crazy warrior side would have still been back in the ring but uh, i know how much it impacted my family to see me in that state so the commentary was the right move Oh, well, I love that for you. And I love that uh, the story getting into it with having to interview Raymond and Nikki. I, <laughs> I saw that um, 
before you were getting ready to fight Raymond Daniels, you mentioned it's nothing personal. It's just business. business. But were there any fights that really stick out in memory that were a little bit on the personal side for you? It would have, to be honest, no until after my career. So um, Nikki Holtzkin and I, uh, Nikki's a huge name, was in the top of the division for so many years. So me coming up and fighting him, we had a, a fight of the year and in Japan, which was crazy. It was a dream to fight there. And we went to, to war there. We battled it out. It was great. I ended up losing in the last 10 seconds, which made the fight even more exciting. And then just from there, there was a little bit of a rivalry of just if I lose to someone, like, I don't like him. I didn't like his personality. I didn't like whatever I lost, I lost. But then I just came back. Like, if it was a, a single fight, I would beat him. I want to fight him again. And then we just kept going back and forth. We didn't really like each other. And then one commentary, um, I had to interview him in the ring. And when I went to interview him in the ring, I said, my question was, I wasn't enthusiastic about it. I was like, who do you want to fight next? And then all of a sudden, his response was, I want to fight you. And I was just so caught off guard just trying to be a, a professional commentator. The guy I hate just says he wants to fight me. So then I was just like I'm so awkward on the mic in front of everybody. And I think I just said we would all like to see this. I don't know. And then I see you as the next opponent. You. You have to come back and then we uh, finish business. I think I would love that. The fans would love it. So... What else do you think? Give us your start, thoughts. Start training. It's been, buddy. I've been training. Don't worry about it. I would love it. Louis, you finish it here, Dalla. But whatever. I was so irritated. Like the whole night, my blood was <laughs> boiling, and it just—I was so mad. And then I ended up having to less like bash him on Twitter and stuff like that, just to make him feel stupid. But that <laughs> that bothered me so much because I felt like I was in a position I couldn't do anything. I was just like, I want to hit him now. I want to fight him back, but I couldn't. So that bothers me still to this day, but we're kind of squashed. Well, we're kind of, we're okay now, but I know deep inside and I know deep inside, there'll always be something where maybe one day, you know, one day. When you think back to all the places that you got to travel, you've mentioned Japan. I think you've been to Turkey all over the world. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite place that you've gotten to visit so far through your combat sports journey? Through combat sports, Japan easily. Um, so I grew, my coach used to coach Gary Goodridge um, in the K1 and pride days. And Gary was a huge star in Canada and all of combat sports. So I just looked up to him and he would like always see me. He would always like tap me on the back. Uh, him and his sister used to call me like a young Oscar De La Hoya because I was young. So they were so nice to me. And so at that point, they uh, I just would talk to him and hear stories. And he'd always talk about Japan. And my coach would talk about Japan. And I was so to me, going there and competing for it was just amazing. And just the culture there, the way you hear stories about how quiet the arena is. And it's so weird. And it's amazing how passionate the fans are. I was fighting in smaller New York places. North America kickboxing isn't huge. So to go to Japan and see 10,000 passionate fans and they're quiet and like even one memory, I, I brought my dad with me to, to a lot of my big fights. And just I remember walking and then seeing a, a family. They were all so nice and respectful, taking pictures with the grandmother to the little son to the father and just signing things for them. It's just they were just so nice. The culture, the people, the spirit of fighting there it's just always will forever be my favorite memory and it was uh i fought in a tournament in japan so i had to fight uh which was crazy for me and one night if people know combat sports i fought raymond daniels and i ended up to i ended up knocking him out with a head kick so you can you know raymond daniels, he's lost maybe three times now with a guy of it was lost to me and he lost to nikki holtzkin so raymond daniels fantastic so to beat him so going backtrack in my career, he was the most nervous I ever was to fight someone was Raymond Daniels because I never wanted to be a highlight to a spinning kick. So the whole time I was like, I just don't want to get hit with one of those things and have it replayed for the rest of my life. So I'm terrified of how dynamic he was. So I was, and he was 24 and 0 at the time. Yeah, I was terrified of him. And so I think at that point, I would have been a 10 and 1, 10 and 1, maybe at that point. So then I just, after beating him and the way I did, they beating him and then I was so excited and then I remember, I got to go one more time. So it was a long walk to the backstage. As soon as I start walking back, the other fight finished by knockout. So then I went back, like, we got to change your gloves. 
So I had, I think, white gloves on. They cut them off. I put my black gloves on, and I walked right back out, and I fought Nikki Holtzkin. So, like, within Raymond Daniels' 30-minute break, fighting Nikki Holtzkin was just insane for me. So, like, on top of Japan, that night I got one of the best knockouts in combat with that Raymond Daniels head kick and a fight of the year in one night. So, to me, the greatest single night in my career, for sure. Uh, I definitely have to visit Japan at some point. It seems like the most beautiful place ever. Um, when we're looking at the future for you, I know you're going to be focused on a lot of commentary stuff going on. What, mm -hmm. in your opinion, makes a good color commentator? Mm, that's a good question. Um, what makes a good color, color commentator? One, you have to obviously be knowledgeable about the sport. Um, passion is another one. And you almost have to have the voice for it. Um, not necessarily like a commentator voice, but more of uh, you have to match the energy. And I think that's what I learned. Mm -hmm. My broadcast partner is, to me, master. Todd? His name's Todd Grisham. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's so awesome. Good. He's so experienced. He was with WWE for eight years, commentating and doing backstage with them. He's done the UFC. He's now boxing. He just did Joshua. So this week, uh, last week, he did – the Joshua Nagano fight in Saudi Arabia took a 1 a.m. flight, flew to Holland, made it on Saturday for fight day, called the big heavyweight Grand Prix we did. So he's just so experienced all over the world. And he's been teaching me. So it's more of like he's that loud, like think of like Amaro Ronaldo. Ah, and he yells. Mm -hmm. If he's going, oh, my God, what an amazing knockout, knockout of the year. And then I'm like, yeah, that was good. That was great. Uh, he did it so well. And he did it with – so it's like you have to match that energy. So if he's at a 10, you got to get up to at least an 8 or 9 to match him and get excited with him. And you have to, at the end of the day, entertain the fans. If you're not entertained, the fans aren't going to be entertained. So keeping it passionate, keeping it fun, and still being a fan of it. Like when I see knockouts still, like I'm like, ah! You hear me like still making noises out of just pure natural, you know, reaction to things. So I think that's just – still being a fan and passionate and loving it. Uh, I think that's comes off on, uh, on camera for sure. I love that. And sometimes after events, there's such like an adrenaline high, you're still kind of awake and it's hard to go to bed very Always. quickly. Um, so what is your uh, post fight night routine? Like, are you the type of person that kind of stays out a little bit? Or are you going home having a little edible to relax? Like what is your wind down routine? Uh, so it's usually late in Holland and we have to fly out the next day. So Ooh. I've learned one, I used to, everyone, I used to watch other commentators and they would drink like Red Bull during the show. So that was like, okay. But then I'm like, I'm not going to, then I wasn't sleeping at night. And then I'd, I'm a terrible traveler. So I get, uh, I get vertigo on planes. Uh, I don't love to be on planes. I get a little anxious on it. So like, it seems weird how much I travel, but there's a little and the vertigo doesn't help. So when I was first started, it would be, let's get as much beer and stuff. And remember, you're in Holland. So let's talk about weed. You want weed. You want alcohol. You're taking those edibles. And then you're trying to sleep and go to the fight the next day. Not the best. But uh, now I try to stay a little bit nicer. We uh, have a beer or two. Edible is probably always nice to have there when you're there to help you go to sleep. And then uh, usually just food. Uh, we hang out in uh, the hotel lobby. If you've been to Fight World, usually the hotel lobby is where the fun happens because yeah. fighters will come back. They're all banged up. You're tired. you got to travel the next day. So the hotel lobby on fight days uh, and end up being the place to be. So we hang out, socialize, talk to some of the fighters, eat some food, you know, have a few drinks with them, socialize, and then you go to bed. But that's almost the fun time because everybody's guard is down. You can talk mm -hmm. about the fights. Where else in the world are you where you're talking to – Again, people might not realize if, if you want to use a UFC example, it's like after the event, you get to have um, a beer and socialize with um, the best coaches in the world. Eric Nixick, you know, Tyson Chartier is the um, I don't know. The, give me some top MMA coaches, um, all of them. And you're just you, sitting with all good. these people. No, there's, good. there's more, though. Eugene Behrman. Eugene Behrman, yeah, all of those. And you're just sitting there talking, socializing, having a beer with them. And then it's just like, wow, look where I am. I'm, I'm talking with 
you know, in the kickboxing world. Here's Remy Bonyaski. Here's Antonio Plazabad. Here's Big Mike. So you're talking about all these legends and just socializing. Sometimes you forget because you've been doing it for so long how lucky it was. Because when I first envisioned being there, I was like, wow, there's Big Mike. And, you know, there's the coach. There's Remy. There's Melvin Manhoff. There's, you know, there's Alistair Overeem. And then now all there's of a sudden you're – There's Boss Root and Meta Karate Combat. Yeah. <laughs> but I actually saw I've seen him at a few glory events. Like, no, but like I'm I'm still yeah. so passionate. Like you saw me when I walked in that room with boss. I was like a little kid. I, I was know. so excited. Hey, boss, can I get a picture? I got goosebumps. <laughs> I, I was so excited to talk to him and share his stories with him. And so I'm like I'm still so passionate about it. So it's like I think that's where the fun for it is. I'm still a little kid when it comes to this. Yeah, no, that's definitely what makes everything uh, so fun. Do you think you're going to be taking your dad to any of your upcoming events, or does he not like to travel as much if he's getting a little bit older? No, he, he still would like to come, but the problem is I used to take them when it was in North America a lot. To take my parents to Europe now, it's, uh, it's a little bit harder for them, but uh, hopefully they do. It would be nice for them to experience – kickboxing in Holland because they saw me fight at in LA my mom never watched me fight so this is a funny story my mom oh, wow. um wouldn't watch me compete. traditional Italian mom who always if you think of an Italian mother that's my mother she still helps me at the gym now which is amazing twice a week she comes in but when she comes in she brings a bag of food for me all packed in Tupperware still like still my traditional you're a Italian mama's mom. boy uh, definitely a mama's boy <laughs> so she would never be able to watch um when I was doing Taekwondo, there was a moment where while I was doing Taekwondo, I was doing jujitsu at the same time. So all of a sudden, this kid kept hitting me after the bell. And I kept looking at the ref like, he keeps hitting me like I'm getting pissed off. So then one more time, he did it. Then he did it one more time. And then I got pissed off. So then I shot in for like a double. I slammed him down. I started grounding, pounding him. And then my mom made a comment after. She's like, I'll never watch you again. You had a look in your eyes where like you really wanted to hurt that boy. And it made her very uncomfortable to see me in that oh. scenario. So from that moment, she never watched. And it was uh, tough on her because she felt that her not watching is her not supporting. So I was like, mom, you do all my laundry, you cook my meals for me, like you do way more than anybody would do for me. So once I gave her that, she would kind of like go in another room, probably sitting there and praying to everything. When she knew it was okay, she would kind of come out of the room wherever she was like watching at home with people. Yeah. And then uh, now that I commentate, she loves it. She watches every glory event at home. My parents don't miss it. Um, when I've taken them to shows, they love it. They have so much fun seeing it. As long as her son's not getting hurt, she's okay to watch violence. So as long as it's not me, she's good. So Yeah, I can definitely the, empathize yeah. with that. Yeah. And parents not wanting me to compete, even if it's just in jujitsu, especially if you're, you know, uh, the baby. We're running a little short on time. Sorry, I'm holding you longer than 30 minutes. But I have one final question because it's kind of relevant to karate combat, which is for the audience where we met when he was coaching Diego Avendaño. Um, I don't think you were at his last fight, uh, no. but it, is he, you know, going to be doing another karate combat fight in the future? And do you think you're going to be at a karate combat event anytime soon? Well, anytime I'm not at a glory event and my guys are competing, I'm there. I would never miss it. It just kind of crossed uh, with, a, with an event, so I couldn't make it. But uh, yeah, Diego, we're starting. We're kind of taking like a reset with him. He lost his last two. Um, so we're trying to get him back on track, get him confident again. And to me, Diego is one of the best uh, fighters I've seen. The way he moves, how dynamic, it's just, it's not translating on fight night. So we're trying to get there. So we're still there. I still plan on coming. I have Ross Levine coming, I believe, in about three weeks to come train with me. And, oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So love it. So. Um, I do like karate combat. I know there's a new president. He's kind of building things, trying to make a different look out of it. But uh, I hope it continues to go. And I, I still enjoy your interviews, too. And you do MMA commentary, right? Or as well now? Yeah. Yeah. I work with um, Combate Global, which is they have an, a Spanish broadcast, but they also have an English broadcast. So I'm in Miami a lot. And then my best nice. friend lives in Miami. So I'm not like you and have to leave the next day. I just tell them to like make my stay Stand. longer and i yeah. and i hang out with my girlfriend in in miami so it's definitely so fun and i'm definitely so happy that i got to pick your brain on what you feel like 
makes a good commentator because I love learning from people who are seasoned vets in what they do. Obviously, you have so much experience in the fight game. Uh, and oh, wait, this is my last question because my YouTube channel is a little bit for the jujitsu nerds. You did jujitsu for like a year. And then more you were than like, that. Right, I'm, I'm, done. I'm really? a blue belt. I, I did it more than that. So I did it for a year. So a uh, little backtrack of the story. My uh, he's my brother-in-law is one of the top ranked black belts in Canada. Um, well, it's not really out yet, but uh, he should be by already by now. But he's getting his fifth stripe uh, in the next little bit. So one of the highest in Canada. So I kind of grew up with him. So. Um, he was one of my role models. He was a Canadian MMA pioneer as well as one of the top black belts. So I've always been well-versed in jiu-jitsu and training and being part of it. And then I would do MMA. So I would say I'm more better for MMA grappling than I am straight jiu-jitsu. But in a gi, I'm a blue belt. The plan this year is to do at least three days a week in a gi again. Um, wow. year, it was always my dream to have my brother-in-law, who is uh, Richard Monkey Nanku, to give me my black belt. So that's on my next part of my martial arts development. So when I first retired, I looked at myself and I said, what would make me the best martial artist ever? First thing was I'm only orthodox. So the last 10 years I've worked self-paw. So now I can fight both stances very effectively and efficiently, just as good as uh, one another. Now the next part is I'm not as good on the ground as I am on the feet. So the next 10 years of my life will be more in-depth studying of jujitsu. So that's the next. I gotta be an ultimate, that's my goal. Martial arts for me is uh, not just to end up my career, it's forever. So my goal is to be a black belt in all arts if I can. I love that. You are a true martial artist. It is very inspirational and I cannot wait to see what the future holds for you. Joseph Valtellini, thank you so much for the time. And before we uh, sign off, is there anything that you're working on that you want to give a shout out for uh, fans watching this? The floor is yours. Uh, just thank you for everybody for the support. I mean, thank you for continuing to watch the YouTube channels, bazookatraining.com, anything on Instagram following. I'm just happy to still uh, have your attention after so many years. So thanks everybody. Alex, thank you for having me. And I think uh, I got to give you the compliment on your passion definitely shows in your interviews and your commentary. So keep up the good work. Thank you so much for joining me and Bazooka Joe for this episode of Beast with Brains podcast. If you have any questions for him specifically, we'll definitely have the podcast with him again another time. Leave a comment and be sure to smash that like button because it helps spread this content out to the people who would enjoy it most so thank you so much it's alex and i'll see you guys on the next episode